This episode of The History Guy is brought to you by Mova Globes. Put them in the light, watch them spin, and be amazed. Stay tuned to the end of the episode for a message and a special offer. This is one of those amazing Mova Globes, but this one, of course, represents one of the world's most famous works of art. In 2019, CNN tried to determine what are the most famous works of art based on the number of Google searches for them. And they determined that Vincent van Gogh's The Starry Night was the third most famous, behind only two of Leonardo's works, The Mona Lisa and The Last Supper. In fact, The Starry Night is so popular that there's a good chance you have a representation of it somewhere in your house. If you don't have a MOVA globe, then you might have it hanging on your wall, or a magnet on your refrigerator, or on a mug, or just looking up what's available on Google, you could have it on a, a hoodie, or jewelry, or a watch, or a bedspread, or even a Kleenex box. It has been described as history's most famous celestial scene, and it was like so many other important works of art created by a man who was suffering from insanity. The painting represented on this globe was literally the view that Vincent had from his room in the insane asylum. And that historic connection between great works of art and insanity deserves to be remembered. The exact nature of the mental illness that afflicted the man who signed his paintings simply Vincent is still a matter of dispute. Analysis of his letters indicates that he suffered from severe depressive episodes for at least more than a decade before the notorious incident of December 23, 1888. That night, after an apparent argument with painter Paul Gauguin, Vincent used a razor to slice off his ear, which he then wrapped in paper and delivered to a local woman named Rachel, who is usually assumed to have been a prostitute, but new research suggests might instead have been a maid, asking her to keep this object carefully. While you might have heard at some point that it didn't cut off his whole ear, a letter including a diagram written by Vincent's doctor to an author in 1830 that was discovered in a box of materials at the University of California at Berkeley in 2016, confirms that he did not just slice off his earlobe, as has been widely assumed, but almost his entire left ear. A 2016 issue of The Guardian notes, this makes it clearer than ever what an extreme act of self-harm it actually was. Discovered unconscious that night, Vincent was hospitalized in the French city of Arles. A 2020 study in the International Journal of Bipolar Disorders notes that he was described at the time as having absolutely no will, hardly any desires, or none, which he himself described in a letter as a mental or nervous fever or madness. I do not quite know what to say or how to name it. The doctor who wrote the letter detailing his injury to his ear, Dr. Felix Ray, wrote to Vincent's brother Theo that, when I tried to get him to talk about the motive that drove him to cut off his ear, he replied that it was purely a personal matter. According to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, Dr. Ray believed that Van Gogh was suffering from a form of epilepsy brought on in part by too much coffee and alcohol and too little food. However, he never made an official diagnosis. Vincent then spent the next several months in and out of hospital. Over the period of hospitalizations, he fluctuated between periods where bouts of delusion and what he described as moods of indescribable anguish made his work impossible and periods of great productivity. He painted several works, including paintings of the hospital in Arles and self-portraits showing his bandaged ear. In January, Vincent painted a portrait of Dr. Ray, although the doctor appeared not to have much appreciated it and reportedly used it to repair a chicken coop and now resides in the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow. The problem persisted, and in May, Vincent committed himself to an asylum. The museum writes on its website, Vincent realized in April that he could not risk living alone anymore for the time being. A month later, he had himself voluntarily admitted to the St. Paul de Mazul Psychiatric Hospital in saint Remy. He would eventually spend a year there. Vincent was given two rooms in the asylum, one of which he used as a studio, and again, amid bouts of debilitating madness, he created some of his most famous works. While he worked on interpretations of some of his previous works and works from other artists, he often featured the clinic's gardens, including irises, painted shortly after entering the hospital in May, sold at auction in 1987 for $53.9 million, at the time the most expensive painting ever sold, now on display at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. But it was in June that he painted the work that many today describe as his magnum opus, The Starry Night. While the painting is one of a number of studies done from the view of his window, it has some decidedly peculiar aspects for an artist whose biggest disagreement with Gauguin was that art should derive from nature rather than imagination. 
For starters, while it is a study of the night sky, it had to have been painted during the day, as the hospital didn't allow him to paint in his upper floor room where he stayed at night. The village at the bottom is not visible from his window, and it's unclear whether it represented the actual village of San Remy or was derived from sketches he had done previously. There is disagreement over whether he could have seen the cypress tree so prominent on the left side of the painting from his room, but in any case it is clearly magnified for any view we would have had from his window, and later analysis found that his depiction of the moon could not have accurately represented its face at the time. While there has been ample analysis of the famous work, its exact connection to his mental illness is unclear. In their 2012 book, Van Gogh, A Life, authors Stephen Nypha and Gregory White Smith speculate that it might have been more abstract than some of Vincent's other works because he was already experiencing the seeds of another breakdown, which would occur in July, and thus his defenses were breached. So why is this painting, painted at least in the proximity of mental illness, and some argue the result of it, so popular. Vincent himself didn't think much of it, including it apparently among a number of paintings that he wrote to his brother, says nothing to me. Nor was it immediately famous. Vincent had only begun to gain acclaim in the art world, and most of his paintings went unsold, did not become well known until marketed by his wife Joanna after his death. The Starry Night was one of many of his paintings she lent to art museums to display, helping to build his posthumous fame. The painting did not start to acquire the fame that makes it so well known today until it was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1941. As to why it has become so famous, most art historians will talk about the bold interplay of colors and the serene scene, but a 2006 study found something quite interesting. Examining the Starry Night and other paintings by Vincent, researchers found that, despite their apparently abstract designs, they represented natural turbulence with a high degree of precision. The researchers analyzed the luminance, a measure of the luminous intensity per unit area of the paintings, and compared them to a mathematical model of turbulent flow in fluid dynamics that was developed by Russian mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov. Their conclusion was that, in summary, our results show that Starry Night and other impassioned Van Gogh paintings, painted during periods of prolonged psychotic agitation, transmitted the essence of turbulence with high realism. Thus, a starry night represents such a hyper-realistic depiction of nature that it goes to a level of mathematical precision. And that might say something both about Vincent and his audience. Did his insanity affect his art? And is that part of the explanation for why his art is still so popular? The exact nature of Vincent's mental illness has not been definitively determined. In 2016, the Van Gogh Museum held a symposium of 35 experts doctors, psychologists, and art historians to examine the existing record of Vincent's life, not just the period when he was hospitalized, in hopes of clearly diagnosing what his illness was. The panel agreed that Vincent suffered from at least three episodes of psychosis, but aside from ruling out schizophrenia, they could not come to a conclusive diagnosis as to the underlying cause. He almost certainly suffered from bipolar disorder, manifested at least since 1874, but likely other conditions as well. Suggestions include exposure to lead used in his paint, toxic effects of a plant called foxglove used as a treatment while in the asylum, borderline personality disorder, syphilis, temporal lobe epilepsy, the inner ear disorder Meniere's syndrome, alcohol intoxication and or alcohol withdrawal, thujone poisoning from drinking absinthe, sunstroke from painting in the sun, work stress, lack of sleep, and the central processing disorder Erlen syndrome. In the end, the International Journal of Bipolar Disorders writes, Our main conclusion in the case of Vincent van Gogh is that no single disorder can explain all the mental problems he had throughout his life, but that he likely suffered from several comorbid disorders. Whatever the underlying cause, Vincent would not overcome his mental illness. On July 27th, Vincent took a small pocket pistol that belonged to his landlord and shot himself through the chest. He died 30 hours later. His brother Theo was with him in his final hours. He wrote, One of his last words was, This is how I wanted to go. It took a few moments, and then it was over. And he found the peace he hadn't been able to find on earth. In trying to divine the connection between the starry night and Vincent's madness, it becomes clear that the connection is not unique. Hugo van der Goes was a noted 15th century Flemish painter whose work was a powerful inspiration during the Italian Renaissance. Like Vincent, he suffered from periods of melancholy over a number of years. In 1482, he suffered a bout that rendered him unable to work. Like Vincent, he attempted suicide and spent time in a mental asylum. He died a short time after. 
His mental disorders were recorded by a monk named Gaspar Ofries, and the Chronicle was discovered in 1863. In 1872, Belgian painter Emile Waters painted Madness of Hugo van der Goes, depicting Hugo in the asylum. Vincent mentioned the painting in letters at least three times, liking his own appearance to the haunted face in Waters' painting. Vincent's life will bear some striking similarity to that of abstract impressionist Jackson Pollock, considered to be one of the most influential modern artists. His painting, number 17A, is the fifth most expensive painting to be auctioned off in history, selling for $200 million in 2015. Like Vincent and Hugo van der Goes, Pollock lived a turbulent life that included bouts of extreme melancholy. The website The Bipolar Addict referred to him as self-destructive, ill-tempered, prolific, brilliant. Like Vincent, his painting, though abstract, represented uncanny mathematical precision. His painting so faithfully represented fractiles, patterns found in natural scenery that recur on multiple scales, that the authenticity of works disputed to have been painted by Pollock can be determined using mathematical models of fractiles with 93% accuracy. Based on his behavior, many clinicians argue that Pollock must have suffered from bipolar disorder, and as is the case with Vincent, that might be a good explanation for Pollock's well-known alcoholism, as alcohol is often used by sufferers of bipolar disorder to self-medicate. And like Vincent and Hugo van der Goes and so many others, Pollock was not able to escape his condition, dying in 1956 in an alcohol-related car accident. While The Starry Night was the third most Googled work, according to CNN, Norwegian simplest artist Edward Munch's work popularly called The Scream, painted in 1893, was fourth. An iconic work that to many represents the anxiety of the human condition, Munch actually produced a series of similar works. One version of the work sold at auction for $120 million in 2012. Munch described the work in his diary. I stopped and looked out over the fjord. The sun was setting and the clouds turning blood red. I sensed a scream passing through nature. It seemed to me that I heard the scream. I painted this picture, painted the clouds as actual blood. The color shrieked. Like Jackson Pollock and Hugo van der Goes and Vincent van Gogh, Munch suffered from bouts of melancholy, madness, and alcoholism. Like Vincent and Hugo, Munch spent time in a mental asylum. And like Vincent, he had episodes of psychosis, including delusions. Although unlike the others, Munch lived a long life and died a natural death. Dr. Albert Rothenberg notes in a 2015 edition of Psychology Today that analysis of Munch's diary suggests a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and psychosis. The connection between the scream and madness is more direct than in other works. One version has a small pencil inscription in the corner. Written in Norwegian, it translates, could only have been painted by a madman. Study using modern technology and techniques has confirmed that the note was written by Munch himself. Rothenberg explains that Munch's vision was clearly a visual hallucination that was creatively transformed by Munch over a period of 18 months into a work of art. As a historian, that historic connection between art and madness is particularly fascinating. It brings together the study of history and art and even mathematics to help to delve into one of the most basic questions of history, and that is how people cope with the human condition. It is clear that throughout history, mental illness has been associated with many important artists and their iconic works. The connection is not just in the visual arts, as Leslie McClurg of San Francisco Public Broadcasting Station KQED wrote in 2017. There's a long history of mental illness in poets, performers, and artists. This is true to the point that there's wide acceptance of the idea of a mad genius. That is, that madness is what enables the genius. Edvard Munch wrote in his diary that my fear of life is necessary to me, as is my illness. They are indistinguishable from me, and their destruction would destroy my art. Vincent also suggested in a letter in 1890 that madness was the price of art, writing, Ah well, I risk my life for my own work, and my reason has half foundered in it. Bipolar disorder might in fact be part of the explanation for art. Dr. Richard Kogan, a clinical psychiatrist at Weill Cornell Medical Center, noted in 2017 that there are features of elevated moods associated with mental illness that are conducive to creativity. For example, when individuals with bipolar disorder are in a hypomanic state, they experience increased energy, playful imagination, and a decreased need for sleep. 
But that sort of legendary concept of the mad genius simply oversimplifies. In fact, most of these artists, when they were in periods of breakdown, were unable to work. The Guardian notes that, far from inspiring his work, Van Gogh's illness was an impediment to his talent. An intriguing idea is that art, like the alcoholism that was also common among them, might have been a self-treatment to fight the madness. Vincent, for example, clearly fighting his illness, painted 75 paintings and made more than 100 drawings and sketches in the 70 days between when he left the asylum in May 1890 and when he shot himself in July. Dr. Kogan hypothesizes that music was used by many troubled composers, from Gershwin to Beethoven, to stave off mental illness. The connection might be found in the mathematical precision of the works, which might help to find order in chaos. Heinrich Jensen of the Department of Mathematics, Imperial College London, writing in the Journal of Interdisciplinary Science Reviews in 2002, contends that mathematics and fine art painting are two examples of the human consciousness striving to comprehend reality, not just the immediate physical reality around us, but reality in its broadest sense. And if art is the way that these geniuses coped with their mental illness, then maybe that says something about why so many of us who face our own challenges in life, well, love their art. It is how we cope with the challenges of history. How we stave off insanity. Ninky Baker of the Van Gogh Museum Amsterdam notes that, to the end, Van Gogh did his painting despite his illness. Not because of it. It is important to remember that. If you are a fan of the History Guy, then you've seen me several times with one of these amazing globes. Yes, that is spinning all by itself. There's no cords, there's no batteries. It runs just by ambient light and the Earth's own magnetic field. This is called a MOVA globe, and its first-of-the-kind technology that lets it spin just based on ambient light comes in more than 40 designs. Not just great works of art like this one, but also things like this fantastic globe based on a historical globe that was made in 1790, or this one, which shows the clouds of Neptune, based on photos that were taken by Voyager 2 and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. MOVA globes have incredible detail, and if one of these is on your desk, I guarantee you it will be an important point of conversation, and they make great gifts. And you are in luck, because Mova Globes is right now holding their biggest sale of the year. Check out the link in the description for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguy.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.